Okay, welcome back. So we're talking about capacitors and capacitance in this series of slides, and we're both going to be describing what a capacitor is, what it does at a basic level, and then um, once we understand that and how it reacts when we put it into an AC circuit, we will be well equipped after our discussion of inductors to put the two of these things together, the capacitor and the inductor, and talk a little bit about how they combine to allow us to tune to a particular radio signal coming into the antenna of our simple radio receiver. Okay, so capacitors along with inductors and resistors, those are kind of the big three in terms of electrical components in analog electrical circuits. And so it's good that yeah, as, the, as the course is winding up, we're finally getting around to the third of these. So a capacitor, as we learned way back when at the beginning of the course, is basically just two pieces of metal, typically it's a very thin metal foil, but relatively large in area. And those pieces of metal are separated by a piece of insulator. Okay, so you've got insulator here in the middle, and that can be something as simple as like paper or Teflon or plastic or something along those lines. And if you attach a battery to the terminals of a capacitor, so you imagine like a wire sticking out here and a wire sticking out here, and we grab those with some wires and we connect them to a battery down here, well then um, our current, right, our conventional current flows in this direction. And remember that indicates the direction that positive charges would flow in the circuit. So what happens is you get a buildup of positive charges on the left plate here, okay? So a buildup of uh, excess in protons. What that's actually doing at a physical level is it's taking electrons away from that plate, okay? But, um, right, following our current, posit positive charge onto this plate, so hence the positive Q, Q being the charge on the plate. And um, that means that if you have a whole bunch of positive charge on this plate, it's going to attract a bunch of electrons onto this plate, an equal magnitude of charge. So the same Q here and here, are just negative because it's made up of an excess of electrons. And this separation of charge, right? They can't go to one another because there's an insulator in between them, okay? So normally you, you would just expect there to be this big electric force and this, you know, these negative charges would be attracted there and these positive, tra positive charges would be attracted there and they'd eventually get together and be neutral. But because the insulator is there, they can't. And, but those electric forces are still present and the present, presence of those intense electric forces between those opposite charges means that there is quite a bit of energy being stored in this separation of charge, okay? And <clears throat> that's the basic idea behind a capacitor. And I think the, the one example of an application of a capacitor we looked at before was in something like a camera flash bulb where you needed to have a big surge of current through a filament to create a bunch of light. And the capacitor can do that because if you charge up a capacitor and then you know sever the connection to the battery here and here and then connect it to a light bulb over here, okay? the charge limited only by the resistance in the filament of the light bulb uh, will whiz around this circuit and go towards its obviously charged neighbors, just like you would with a battery. It becomes essentially the voltage source of this, uh, this, of this circuit that we would create it here with the light bulb, okay? So a couple of basic characteristics about capacitors, and there is an equation that relates some of the, the relevant quantities here uh, to what's called the capacitance. So like inductance, like resistance, this capacitance is based on the materials and geometry of the capacitor. Things like uh, how big are these, in area, are these conducting plates? How big is this gap of insulator between the conducting plates? It turns out the thinner it is, the more energy you can store per, um, per unit charge, things like that. Um, but just based on materials and geometry, okay? Don't need to know exactly which bits of that, okay? And so if you pick up a capacitor in the lab, then it says, okay, well, it has X number of farads of capacitance that tells you its capacity as measured by the ratio of charge stored and voltage difference across the capacitor. 
the idea being that this ratio between the charge stored and the voltage difference across the capacitor is always the same for a particular capacitor, x number of farads of capacitance, right? Only based on materials and geometry, so this is whatever it is for a particular capacitor, which means that if you raise the voltage difference across the capacitor, so you use like a, a bigger battery over here, you go from like a one and a half volt battery to a nine volt battery, well then you're going to have proportionally more charge stored on these plates and thus store larger amounts of electric energy. All right. So, how do we use these other than to put a bunch of charge flowing through a uh, flash bulb or something like that? Well, let's look at another simple DC circuit with some switches like we did with the inductor, and that'll give us sort of a feel for what we expect to happen in terms of a capacitor storing, alternately storing and releasing electric charges. All right, so first of all, the circuit symbols for a capacitor, you might see some varieties on this. The, the basic one, the one we'll stick with is, is this one, kind of looks like a capacitor. You've got two uh, conducting plates next to one another, separated by an insulated gap. Uh, this one also looks pretty similar, okay, and um, but it gen generally tends to indicate uh, a specific kind of capacitor called an electrolytic one, which cares about uh, the direction of the voltage that you apply to it, kind of like an LED, though for different reasons. Okay. In any case, uh, those are the circuit symbols you might see running around for capacitor. We'll stick with this one. And here's our circuit. And we're again going to plot current. We're also going to put uh, voltage across the capacitor on the air in a little bit on our graph, but right now just current. And we're in a situation where we have just closed the left hand switch. So we've just closed this switch so that we complete a circuit with a battery and a resistor and a capacitor all in series. Now, <clears throat> what's going to happen is that at first there's um, the current jumps right up to whatever the maximum value it's going to have is. Okay, there's nothing preventing it from doing that. Uh, the only thing preventing it from going any higher is the presence of this resistor. Okay, so if you have, um, if you want to know exactly what that current value would be for this particular circuit, then you just use Dohm's law, right? That uh, voltage would be the source voltage of the battery, and then this would just be the resistance of the resistor, okay? Because when there's no charge on the capacitor, or when you've like put one positive charge on there, uh, and thus one negative charge on there, and it's not really, there's no voltage difference across it. You don't have much of a separation of charge yet because very little charge has actually flowed through the circuit to start accumulating on this, this side of the capacitor and then flowing away from this side of the capacitor to complete the circuit. So uh, the only thing resisting, either apparently or really, is the resistor, okay? Wherever many ohms that is. However, over time, right, we're packing more and more and more positive charges onto this plate, and that accumulates more and more negative charges over here. And so the voltage across the capacitor, we're calling it V sub C, well, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And you notice the polarity that it's going to have, it's going to be trying to drive current the other way, right? Opposing the DC source that we have attached over here. And so it's going to act like a resistance, even though it's not a resistance like a resistor is, right? It's not dissipating the ener electric energy as heat, it's just storing charge. But as you might imagine, once you have four charges on here, it's harder to add a fifth. And then if you have five charges, it's harder to add a sixth. And the idea behind that is just goes back to electric forces. If you have a larger amount of charge, it's harder to push another uh, same or like charge, rather another positive charge to that large positive charge. And then the positive charge is larger. And so it's even harder to push the next one. And eventually the voltage supplied by the battery just can't push any more charge on the, on the capacitor. And the capacitor's voltage cancels out the source voltage, okay? So over time, this is what happens. You get this big spike in current, and when you first close this left-hand switch, 
But then as the charge accumulates on the capacitor, well, the current is going to start dropping off because effectively you're adding resistance because the polarity of the capacitor opposes the battery. Okay? <clears throat> as far as what's happening with the voltage across the capacitor, so you know, put our voltmeter or something across here and measure that F V sub C, well, as the current, as charges accumulate on it, and as the current drops off, its voltage increases, okay? To the point where at this point, at its maximum point, okay, it's actually going to equal the source voltage. If you have two batteries of equal voltage, if you just think about the capacitor like, like a different kind of battery for the moment, if you have two batteries of equal voltage trying to push current the opposite direction to each other in a circuit, well, then just nothing happens. Their voltages cancel. And that's exactly what happens here. We get to our maximum voltage where V sub C equals V sub S, and that cancels all of the voltage from the battery. And that means that the current flowing through the circuit at that moment is going to be zero, okay? Like that. Okay. So no current, maximum V sub C equal to the battery's voltage. And if that's the case, then no current flows through the circuit despite should have drawn it right on the axis, but you get the idea. Okay, so the next step that we're going to take, just to again get an idea of what it looks like when the capacitor is discharging rather than charging, is we're going to open the left-hand switch and we're going to close the right-hand switch. So opening the left-hand switch, right, is going to get rid of the battery in any closed circuit, and then closing the right-hand switch is going to make a closed circuit uh, just with the resistor and the capacitor. So left switch open, right switch closed, and now the capacitor, well, it has this big chunk of charge on each of its plates, and those are opposite charges, and so it acts like a voltage source. It is a voltage source, and so it causes current to flow in this circuit. As you can see here, it goes around and around and around, but as positive charge flows away from this, and flows to the negative charges, well, that means that the net charge on each plate is going to be going down, and so the voltage across the capacitor is also going to be going down as this current flows. So for a moment, when the capacitor is at its maximum voltage, right, right up here, well, then it's going to drive a bunch of current that's only limited by the resistance of this resistor. However, as charge flows away from the plates of the capacitor, the voltage across the capacitor goes down, and thus the current, since resistance doesn't change, the resistor has X number of ohms, okay? if you have less voltage and you have the same resistance, then you're going to get less current flowing through the circuit. So over time, the current goes back towards zero, okay? as the voltage across the capacitor also goes down towards zero. Okay, so <clears throat> a couple of things here. One, I show that the, the current is negative here because you'll note that it's flowing the opposite direction to what it was when the battery was connected. So the battery, when the battery is connected, the current goes this way. And the, when we complete this circuit with just the capa charge capacitor and the resistor, the current goes the other way. So that's why it's negative over no, no fanciness okay, other than that. Now, uh, we're generally not going to be looking at the, AC, the these capacitors in DC circuits, though I think it's helpful to look at this kind of thing just to get, give you an idea of what happens when you apply voltages to capacitors and charging up and discharging and things like that. Uh, it, but in an AC circuit, a capacitor has an effect not completely dissimilar to the inductor in an AC circuit. Because you'll notice that just like with an inductor, when we're switching things back and forth and whatnot, the presence of this capacitor in the circuit, once it starts charging up, acts like a resistance to the charging voltage, the battery in this case, because it depresses, you know, if the current would normally be there just because of the resistor, right, as the capacitor charges, Right? There's this gap between what you would expect it to be just based on the number of ohms in the circuit versus what it actually is. And so it acts like an apparent resistance, this reactance that we found for the inductor. 
So in an AC circuit, just like um, with an inductor, we have an equation that can describe the, the apparent resistance or the reactance of a capacitor in this AC circuit. And again, it's dependent on similar kind of stuff. I mean, it's not uh, Henry's of inductance, right? It's a different mechanism that it's storing energy with. Uh, but the capacitor, uh, capacitor's capacitance, right, shows up there. So if we're storing more, um, if we're able to store more charge, let's have we have a big reservoir to push charge into. That means less apparent resistance because you can push a lot more charge onto the plates without having much, having to expend much energy to do it. And then also in here, you'll notice that there's frequency again, okay? But here, the frequency is in the denominator, not in the numerator, okay? And let's just briefly walk through why that might make sense to us, all right? So if we're sending in an oscillating voltage, so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, well then, if the frequency is really high, then you are charging up the capacitor a tiny little bit as you rise in voltage. But then of course the voltage drops off very quickly and so the capacitor will discharge as the voltage supplied by the source drops below whatever voltage is across the capacitor. And if this is happening really, really rapidly, there's never any much charge accumulating on the capacitor. So there's never much opposing voltage being uh, created on the capacitor. And that opposing voltage is the thing that causes this apparent resistance. So if we have a high frequency, we have a low apparent resistance or a low reactance for the capacitor. And if we have a low frequency, so we give it lots of time to charge up during these cycles and then oppose the source voltage or the AC source here, well, low frequency, that, imply, that implies a high apparent resistance from that logic, and that is exactly what the equation shows. So when we come back next time, we will see how these two components, the inductor and the capacitor, work together to give us um, the, effect, the electrical effect that we need to create our tuner in our radio receiver. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you then.